Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see you today. If you would, stand up on your feet. We're going to worship God together this morning. This morning in, in student ministry, we were reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which says that we should give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for our life. Amen? So that's what we're going to do this morning, is just give praise to God for all that he's done, all that he is. He's a good God. He's a Savior. He's the King. So let's just worship him together this morning. Amen? There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. Amen. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Sing. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. why the dead are made alive. There's a reason why we share his resurrection. Jesus is alive. Oh, we sing to you, Lord. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus. Glory and honor, 
majesty. Thank you, God, that um, we come to this room. We are mindful of the fact that, the, that we, need, we need help. And, and, Father, our help comes from you. Our hope comes from you. Father, in fact, we could not have life apart from you. Father, all around this room are stories, stories of redemption, God, where you came to people in the darkest time of their life, and, and Lord, you reminded them that you were there not only for them, but God, you were there to change them. And, and Lord, we, we were redeemed. And it wasn't by anything perishable like silver or gold, but it was by the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus. And Father, we know that through the Word. And God, I pray today that, um, that as we reach out to those around us, as, we, as our hearts just kind of lean in on people that we know that are hurting, Lord, we recognize that you are the God of comfort today too. Lord, you comfort Liz um, over these last several days as she's walked through the, uh, the passing of her husband of 50 years. And, and you will be the God of comfort that will comfort her going forward. Lord, you comfort those in our church family today that, 
to see the unraveling of their own children or their grandchildren, and they are just devastated by this. And yet, God, you are a God of comfort today. So we come to you, the God of comfort, to be that comfort that we need. So, Lord, remind us of your faithfulness. Help us, God, to just lean in on you. In Jesus' name, amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the who believe in you. God, I just pray that we would recognize you as holy every single day. God, because you're worthy of our praise every single moment. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we praise.
Get ready. I am a priceless treasure. God knows me, God hears me, God is my comfort. To embark on an epic quest. Nothing better forgiven and chosen forever. And discover God's greatest treasure. I am a treasure. Uh, Patrick is from Western Australia. He does, um, he's a farmer. Uh, that's what his occupation is. Uh, he's always looking for extra hands on the farm. So um, if you want to get your passport updated and go, he, he, uh, he'll give you a place to, uh, to sleep out under the stars and, and he'll work you all day. So, um, but no, Patrick uh, has, uh, that's what, how he makes a living. But his, his passion is making sure that the Word of God gets out. And it gets out through Gideon's International. And, and Patrick is a follower of Jesus. Uh, he has a wife named Tineke that they're busy. They have uh, three boys and five girls. So he does more than just plow fields. So uh, um, um, they don't have internet. They don't have cable. They have kids. But that's awesome, brother. That's good. You're a fruitful man. So, um, <laughs> Pete, <laughs> I don't even know why. That is not even intended to be funny, but. Uh, <laughs> Lord, pray for me as I go home today. But would you please uh, welcome Patrick as he comes to us. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words, brother. <laughs> Someone once asked me, he said, are you Catholic? I said, no, we're just over the enthusiastic Protestants. You know, I was driving to church a few months back. It was Easter Sunday with my wife and the little ones in the back. It was getting close to nine o'clock and I turned the wireless on in the ute and just to hear the news, you always just want to hear what's going on. And, and I heard that um, about 27, 28 pastors in the eastern states had, had sent it, signed and sent an open letter to the prime minister. This is Easter Sunday for action on climate change. And my heart just dropped. And then that night, I heard on the TV that the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the head of the Anglican Church, which is a big deal in England, and quite large in Australia, his message on Easter Sunday was about asylum seekers. I was thinking, what is the church doing? A brother spoke about being in the battle. The church is in the battle, but we're not in the battle for those the things of the world, we're in the battle for the hearts and minds, the souls of boys and girls, men and women. We have a message to give, all right. We have, actually have a mandate. And the message we give is repentance and restoration through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is the message the church has. And that's the message we give. And the best way to find out about the Lord Jesus is to read it for yourself in your own language in the Word of God, isn't it? So we place the Word of God. We place it wherever we can go. And um, a few years ago, we were in the, in the uh, nation of Malaysia. Now, if you look at that picture there, uh, in East Malaysia, East Malaysia is on the top of the island of Borneo. And it's an official Muslim country. Even though there's a lot of Christianity there, it's officially Muslim and you cannot offer a Muslim a New Testament or witness to one. If we did, we'd be on the plane and the locals did it, they'd be in, in prison. My first night in the hotel, I looked up in the, in the ceiling of the hotel and there was an arrow in the corner of the ceiling. Anyone have any idea what that arrow was for? It was pointing, it was pointing to Mecca. That's what happens in the Muslim countries. 
So we had a briefing on the Sunday night, what we could and what we couldn't do in the schools in, the, uh, in, in Sarawak, which is in Borneo. And the, and the chap was giving us a big list of what we could do. And he said, look, he said, look, man, just, just don't look conspicuous, okay? And off we went Monday morning. First school I was in Monday morning, I was in the, um, I was in the, uh, the um, staff room with a heap of really nervous Muslim teachers. Okay, so these girls were about four foot ten, I'm six foot two. They're brown, I'm white. They've got headscarves on, I've got a big box of New Testaments. And all of a sudden, that message on not being conspicuous just went right out the door, didn't it? <laughs> you know, and we, we were being sensitive about um, where we're going to place them. And what we'd say to the teachers, can you, uh, can you assemble all the non-Muslim students? So in that part of uh, Malaysia, there's a lot of Chinese there. So we had the non-Muslim and the Chinese students. We had them assembled and we give them a copy of the Word of God and the Chinese ones, we had the, had the language in, in, in Chinese. Now this chap here, his name was Daniel. He was my guide for the week and um, he just took us around everywhere. And uh, he said to me, he'd be about his late 60s, only a generation and a half ago, these guys were headhunters. He said, he said once we were headhunters, but someone bought us a word of God. Now we're heart hunters for Christ. That's what he said. You know, it was a real thrill. It was a real thrill to be with these people and um, spend some time with them. And, you know, they got the same hope that we got. They're looking for the blessed hope and return of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like we are. Give us another one. This is a Muslim school here. You know, we, they had them assembled. We'd just pick a few of the non-Muslim kids out and we'd just offer them a New Testament. There they are, we went further out, further out into the country uh, and we offered again the New Testaments to the children. You know, wherever I've been, and you probably find it here, the further out you go in the country, the poorer the people are, the more receptive they are to the Word of God. It's, it's the same in my own country. I think one of the things that John the Baptist, when he was in prison at that darkest moment of his life, and he sent his disciples to Christ and see, see, is that the one or should we wait for someone else? And one of the things told his disciples, Jesus told his disciples, was to tell John the gospels preached to the poor, the poor of the world. You know, the Corinthians, the base things of the world, that's us, of no reputation, the poor. Give us another one. Here we are outside of school, so we've got three, three groups of children coming out of the school. We've got Muslims, we've got the Bahasai Malay, and we got the um, Chinese students. And I couldn't always pick them out, so I'm just feeding New Testaments to our local uh, Gideon there from Malaysia, and he's deciding who can get one and who can't. And, um, and if a Muslim student would want it, we cannot give it to them. You know? We just can't give them a New Testament. But if I was to walk over to the Ute and drop one and then get quick to pick it up, well, that's, that's something different, isn't it? That's, <laughs> That's, that's, I'm not responsible for that, am I? Bring us another one. You know, Gideon's placed a lot of scriptures. In January of 2020, the first month of January before the pandemic, we're in the um, Philippines. In two weeks, we placed 960,000 scriptures. We have countless testimonies of people coming to Christ and, and, and that, but it always comes down to the individual. This young lady here, we'd been, we'd been in a village and we were way out in the jungle there and we had a bit of time. So we spent some time with this girl and um, we we're having a cup of coffee and they're just waiting for the school to open. And we asked her, we said, you know, if you died tonight, could you be sure that you went to heaven? She said, no, I couldn't. Opened the back page and showed her the scriptures. The Bible says, you know, whosoever believeth in him. Aren't you glad for that word, whosoever? It doesn't say, oh, the shiny and the clean and the good and the rich. It says, whosoever. Come to, come to Jesus may have eternal life. We spent some time for it. If that was to be imposed, you'd just see the tears in her eyes. She finally realised that, that she could be a daughter of God. And if she had a couple of, a couple of other friends there with her, and give us another one. That's another girl. There's three girls there. You know, and these girls were they had the, having the trials of life. A brother was talking about the trials of life. I've been in Alabama for a week, up around the parts and speaking to men who've been taking me in their cars to different functions. 
You know, they've got the same problems we got. They've got problems in their family, whatever son is turned to homosexuality. They might have a uh, sickness or, or even an unhappy marriage, just like people in Australia have, just like Christians have. You know, it's, it's part of life, isn't it? Corinthians says, if, if, if only in this world we have hope, we're men most miserable. Our hope is eternal, isn't it? It's eternal. I remember a couple of years back, it was, a, it was a Wednesday night. I was sitting at home. I was sitting by the fire. My oldest daughter was playing the piano. I was just overwhelmed with the goodness of God. The tears of joy just coming down my face. Two nights later, I was in the, um, the intensive care ward of the hospital up in Perth. My father had had an accident and I just gave permission to turn the life support off. He's gone. And I shed tears of just sorrow. That's, that's just life, isn't it? We share the blessings and the hard times. Then on Sunday, I come to the sanctuary. I read that Jesus Christ is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You know, the message we give, we've got to be clear of the message that we give, because in some of these places, their life is still going to be tough. This health, wealth and prosperity rubbish doesn't cut it in these countries. And it doesn't cut it here either, does it? It's nonsense. It's nonsense. What we can promise is eternal life. Know that we have it now. And that, and um, we have that wonderful comfort. Dear sister, I met you today. You have that wonderful comfort. Eternal comfort. you see your husband again in glory. You know, they, they assembled these students here. We're out in the, out further out. We stayed out the night. We're in the middle of nowhere. And there's this big school here. 700 students were, and we walked in and I was singing that song, This Is My Desire. You know, this is a Muslim country. These kids are singing praises. We just had a wonderful placement that night. Keep them coming. There's Daniel, you know, he's just, it's, it's wonderful to be with God's people, isn't it? Encourage and uplift each other and placing the scriptures there. And you can see the height difference, you know? <laughs> I'm the inconspicuous one there. Sorry, guys. Hold on to that one. Went to another school and, and we rang, we told them we're coming and they assembled a couple hundred of the non-Muslim students in a room. And they were going, I went up to the room and wait and the two boys went to see the principal and he come in. And I was, and I, I was just going so good and I said to the principal, thanks for having us, brother. I said, you're a Christian? He said, no, I'm a Muslim, give me that. I thought, oh, it was just going so well. And he stood in front of the children and then, he, and then he said, children, this book is a great book for instruction in your life and guidance in your life. He just gave a wonderful exposition of 2 Timothy 3.16. We couldn't believe it. Here he was extolling the word of God, this Muslim principle. And of course, with his lead, they just all took one, didn't they? they all of them took one and put their hands up, hands up in, in the air. Next one, thanks, brothers. What else we got coming? Yeah, so they just, um, it, was, it was a wonderful, wonderful placement there. I think we've got a few more up there. I don't know. No, we haven't? That's it. That's the last one. Good thing. So, yeah, we just, we just spread the word. We spread the word. I'm, but I'll tell you one thing. I remember another time, my first scripture blitz was in West African nation of Ghana. And I was there the second week. I was with this big Gideon from North Carolina. His name was Bob Ward. He was a big, big boy, he was. When I was, was travelling, I was worried about what to eat. He says, brother, if, if it's fried, it's your friend. <laughs> he said, look at me. He said, I know what I'm talking about. I know food, he said. And, uh, and uh, we, were, we visited this Muslim school and we visited the principal. And um, the principal was a Christian and he had about half a dozen Christian uh, workers, teachers there. And we said to him, said, brother, can we um, do a distribution in this school? He said, I'll just ring the owners. The owners were Muslim owners. I rang them up, talked to them, absolutely no way they were going to let us in. He said, I'm sorry, there's no way. And you know, he was a diminutive little chap. I had no doubt, Bob Ward's, Bob's with me, he's a big guy. I have no doubt that we could have stood over him and said, look, opportunities here, let's do a placement anyway and place the scriptures, 
And then I would have gone home and said, oh, what a great missionary I am. But he got to live there, doesn't he? He got to live there. Who knows what's going to happen to him? It would have been unthinkable. See, we don't force our way in. We let the Lord open the doors. We don't force our way in. I tell you today, nor does Christ, does he? Nor does Christ. He says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. So wonderful to see a young lady who realised that and make that decision. And for someone here today who's just been coming to church, just waiting for something, for a reason, for something to happen that they're going to come to Christ, I exalt you today. Extol you today. Come today. Stand up in front of your mates, your wife, your, your brother. Stand up and make a stand. Young people, it's the best thing you can do, the best decision you can make is to follow Jesus Christ. As I um, finish, I'm going to take you to another country. Now, this country has been blessed by the Lord with riches and abundance and resources for many years. But this country is leadership and is turning us back on the Christ. This country's God is self and money. It's dying of affluenza, I call it. And this, this is a country, listen, where men can marry men. I tell you what, when that happens, there's no surprises, is there? Where the authority of the Word of God is not the authority in the law. And I'm sorry to say that country is Australia. And it's embarrassing me to tell you that. We went and done a school placement. We go to all the country schools in our area. Some of them are a fair distance, a couple hundred kilometres away. And we went up to this school, this little school, we knew there's going to be 17, 18, year seven students. So that's where we target, waiting for us to come. So we got into the school. I went to, I think the school chaplain organised a placement. And went to, went to principal, and this principal come out. She was a lady, she was about five foot. She had bright green hair, really stocky build. And she just looked like a wrestler. She come out and looked at me, a tall, white, middle-aged man in a blue suit. And in me, she saw everything that she hates. Everything. I could tell the way she looked at me. She looked at me. She didn't want me there. I said, ma'am, we're here from the New Testament. There's no way you're going to distribute religious material in this school, she said. I said, no, we just like to give the children a choice. And that word choice just resonated with her. You know how it does with some people? They're all about choice. And miraculously, she let us in. She said, I'm going to stand at the door. You can't. Uh, the children have to opt in. You can't distribute. They have to come and get it themselves. They have to, have to opt in. She said, I said, okay. So we're in the class. There's 17 little kids there. And I opened them the word of God to Matthew chapter 7 about building on the rock. They have never, our, our children have never heard these stories. Australia is past nominal. There's total biblical illiteracy. They've never heard it before. Yet at that age, they've been through the storms of life as a bit the children in the US have. They've experienced the storms of life. They know what it's like to grow up in families. And they know what it's like and they resonated and their little eyes were just lit up. I could tell, I tell them, who's that rock? That rock is Jesus Christ. And I said, I said, if you want one of these, you gotta put your hands up today. Every little hand shot up, every little hand in the room. You know, they all took the word of God. I don't know what the Lord has me to do in the future, where he has me to go, but I'll you never forget, brother, that school placement. What a blessing it is to give the word of God. You know, you hear testimonies from people, some of them are quite extraordinary, but they're always grounded in the word of God, aren't they? Always comes back to the word of God. So I understand this church has supported the scripture fund for before, and I want to uh, I want to just say, please, please do that. We cover all our costs from travelling, wherever, wherever it goes. Wouldn't even dream of taking money out of the scripture fund. We're glad to do that. Because if your ministry don't cost you anything, it's not worth anything, is it? So thank you for hosting me. Uh, the whole state, I've had a wonderful time. There's going to be a bit more of me going home than what came. Probably about four or five pounds more of me going home. And that than what came to, to Alabama, but so be it. And, and thank you. Let me just pray for you. Our Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your mercies 
and kindness to us, Almighty God. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints, Heavenly Father, that we can rejoice for those that rejoice and mourn with those that mourn. We're thankful, Heavenly Father. Oh, how we look forward to the return of our, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, and not as a helpless babe this time, but in his power and his glory and his might. Father, we pray until that day that we'll be about thy business, Heavenly Father. I pray for these people here, Heavenly Father. I pray that they'll be continually united in love, Heavenly Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. The way you can support uh, Gideon's International, each family should have gotten one of these. If you did not, hopefully there's going to be some left at the table as you leave. Um, in that, there's inter information about what Gideon's are doing. Just as a footnote, World Games is in Birmingham. Well, they did a scripture blitz here. And I, they've given out more scripture that's ever been given out in Birmingham, they gave it out in just a couple of days uh, at our World Games. So that's pretty awesome that that's happening right here amongst us. But as Patrick has spoken about what's happening in Australia, what's happening in many places in our world, uh, it's when families and, and worlds fall apart, it's because they get away from truth. The truth is, is that which holds us together. That's why when we are in this battle for, for that which is truth, and the truth is the Word of God, and when Paul says put on the whole armor of God, he starts out with that, the, belt play, uh, the, the, the belt of truth. Because if you don't have the truth, uh, then what do we have? And, and the Word of God doesn't just uh, contain truth. It is the truth. It is the truth. And, and, and the only way that we can counteract the problem of a decaying society and a decaying home is, is to stand upon the truth, the Word of God, the Word of God. Uh, Joseph Goebbels, who was Hitler's uh, minister of propaganda, said that if you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, and often enough, you can make people believe anything. Boy, we, we've heard that, haven't we? We've heard those lies being told long enough, loud enough, over and over again, and people are believing a lie every day to their own detriment. But it is the truth. It's the word of truth, the word of God, that will change everything about a person's life. So as Patrick has spoken, how the word of God and the, and the Jesus of the word of God changed his life, it's that same Jesus that can change your life. So for just a moment, we're going to give a response time, a time of invitation. And I want you to just bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and I want you to just think through what you've heard today. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, um, you've been doing all of these things in your life. You've been going to church. You've been, you know, being around good people and, and, and you realize that it's good to be around church people and, and good people. But Jesus Christ did not come to make good people better. Christ Jesus came to make dead people live. Because without Christ, you are dead in your sin. You're dead. And only Jesus Christ can make you alive. And when Jesus comes to make you alive, then your life will reflect the fact that Jesus lives in you. Because Jesus living in us is that hope of glory. It's that hope. If you have not trusted Christ, if for whatever reason today is that day that you're ready to surrender all of your life to Jesus, then while we're having this time of response, as Nathan and Brooks leads us in an invitation, you can just get up. You don't, we're not all going to stand, but you can just get up. You just come forward. If you want to come and sit on this front row and someone will pray with you or I will pray with you or we will talk afterwards. But, but if God is working in your life, please, 
Let God have his way. Let God have his way. But more than offerings, Lord, you seek the depths of me when you see me, you see my heart through the eyes of your mercy in the light of your son. Unconditional and in your eyes, I'm worthy of forgiveness. What was lost is now redeemed. When you see me, you see my heart through the eyes of your mercy in the light. Right. 